the United States is pushing west into uncharted territory and danger. As they tame the wilderness, the pioneers face incredible hardship. But their battles will build the new American nation. million years BC. A meteorite hurtles towards Earth. It strikes the Appalachian Mountains with the force of a hundred thousand atomic bombs. The five-mile crater it leaves behind creates the Cumberland Gap, which becomes a gateway to the West. I think Americans have always been, have been pioneers. For a nation of adventurers and explorers. We are always moving forward, and we're always dealing with problems, not ignoring them. By 1775, land west of the Cumberland Gap has been claimed and divided by Britain, France, and Spain, as well as hundreds of Native American tribes. But the strongest claim to this fertile land belongs to whoever conquers it. Riches too, thousands of tons of gold and silver. This land is also brutal wilderness. Conquering it will require extraordinary people. In March 1775, explorer and frontiersman Daniel Boone pushes west. Boone and his 30 men slash through the Cumberland Gap on a mission to settle new lands. Coming through, coming through here. Before us lay the finest body of land in the world, with which little exertion we can call our own. One day thousands will desire this land, and we will be rich. Boone's push into the West becomes a defining act for the new nation. The British king has outlawed any Western expansion. Illegal settlers are rounded up and punished. But Boone is prepared to defy the British. Daniel Boone was that first great action hero for America. America wanted to see itself that way, I think. They wanted to see themselves as fiercely independent, uh, very capable, and and willing to go places most human beings wouldn't have gone. Come on, man, this way. Boone and his men take no supplies. Come on, come on! They survive from the land, using bear grease as insect repellent and wasp larvae as food. Come on, come on! Boone records in his journal we're exposed daily to peril and death among savages and wild beasts. But nature satisfies all we need. Few experience the happiness we feel here in the howling wilderness. But for the Shawnee, this isn't wilderness. It's home. And they will defend it from intruders. Good work, 
Good job. Good work. These areas that seemed like wilderness to the Americans weren't wilderness to these American Indian people. They were just their lands. Daniel Boone and the Shawnee have a history. Only the year before, they kidnapped his eldest son, James. And tortured him to death. On the 25th of March, 1775, Boone crosses into Shawnee territory. In the mountains for eight days. Treats. Two of his companions are scalped and slaughtered. But Boone pushes on further west. Well, I think more than anything, the American character is perseverance. They persevered, they fought. It wasn't easy against great odds, but they have persevered. Boone's friend and companion, Felix Walker, writes, He conducted the company through the wilderness with such bravery. Indeed, he appeared void of fear, with too little caution for the enterprise. Many of Boone's followers die settling Kentucky. But within 20 years, 200,000 people pour through the Cumberland Gap. We were a burgeoning society. Suddenly we realized, whoa, the owner's manual says this is all ours. Keep going west. In 1803, the new nation expands westward with one of the biggest property deals in history. U.S. President Thomas Jefferson buys the vast Louisiana Territory from Napoleon of France. Half a billion acres at three cents an acre. It doubles the size of the United States. And triggers a new wave of exploration. Lewis and Clark want to see what's on the other side. Given a mountain, we want to climb it. We hold those venturers of the past uh, in great admiration. In May 1804, a presidential aide and a junior army officer set out on an epic expedition. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark planned to be the first to cross and map the continent. Their greatest challenge, crossing the vast Rocky Mountains. No one expects the Rockies to be 90 separate mountain ranges, 4,800 kilometers long. After two weeks, starvation sets in. They eat any plant they can find. Next, they eat their horses. The expedition is given up as dead. But they survive 
and they owe their lives to a 16-year-old Native American girl. Sakakawea of the Shoshani Nation guides them, finds wild food, and saves their precious million-word journals from an overturned canoe. In December 1805, William Clark notes in his journal, Ocean in view. Oh, the joy. They are the first US citizens to reach the Pacific Ocean overland. Lewis and Clark's remarkable expedition discovers 300 species of wildlife, transforming science and agriculture, and triggering a new rush into the unknown. In 1803, two explorers have pushed back the frontiers of the United States. Lewis and Clark's expedition through the Rockies has also uncovered a route to the West's most valuable commodity, beaver. Their pelts are traded by Native Americans for guns. Knives, salt, and they're a high fashion luxury for the rich. In Europe, beavers have been hunted to near extinction, but in the Rocky Mountains, they number in the millions. New iron traps make catching them easier. Baited with the beaver's own scent glands, the animals are drawn to their deaths. By October 1823, there are 300 eager trappers roaming the Rockies, hoping to make a fortune. One in five won't make it out alive. The conditions are so exhausting, trappers need to eat three times what we eat today to survive. Jedediah Smith is the most successful hunter in the Rocky Mountains. 24 years old, he walks up to 1,600 kilometers each year, traps 600 pelts in a season, the equivalent of three years' average pay back east. A devout Christian, he doesn't drink or smoke. His Bible and his gun are constant companions. He's also astute and works with the Native Americans. The crows show him ancient shortcuts, sell him horses, nurse his sick men back to health. The tribes of North America have adapted to living in every part of the continent, from arid plains to harsh mountain terrain. Jed Smith uses their knowledge and his skill to open up the West for vast fur trapping profits. But it will almost kill him. Smith's friend, James Kleiman, writes, The grizzly did not hesitate, springing on the captain, breaking his ribs and cutting his head. <laughs> this gave us a lesson on the character of the grizzly, which we did not forget. The grizzly bear is the most dangerous wild animal on the frontier. Up to three meters tall, they can weigh 450 kilos. In early 1800, 
100,000 roam the Rockies, 50 times more than today. Halfway to death, Jed Smith's right-hand man, James Kleiman, stitches his scalp and ear back to his head. I put in my needle, stitching it through and through and over and over, laying the lacerated parts together as nice as I could. There is an amazing sense of, of confidence as part of that American uh, spirit that doesn't... Um, even think about failing. Jed Smith pushes on. The epitome of American rugged individualism. The trails he forges become settler paths and wagon trains. Today, they are roads and an interstate highway. Many Americans follow in his tracks. May 1846. Thousands of men, women and children, riding, walking, pushing. They're heading for a new life 3,000 kilometers away. It was a land of opportunity. You can make of yourself what you want. You're only held back by your own desires. Germans, Belgians, French, Catholics, Presbyterians, Mormons. One of the world's great mass migrations begins. Pioneers follow the wagon trail west to Oregon and California. Like the frontiersmen before them, their journeys will become another part of American mythology. Some walk 16 kilometers a day for up to six months, going through 10 pairs of boots on the journey. Half are children, one in five of the women are pregnant. Families sell farms, saving for an average of five years to join the exodus, risking everything. I think if there is one episode that encapsulates the American spirit, I think it is probably the move west. Whip those mules and horses and cross those rivers and cross over those mountains to the unknown and say, I'm leaving everything behind. I'm leaving everything that I know behind to reinvent myself. A wagon and oxen cost minimum $5,000. But it buys a complete life support machine. The wagons carry nearly 500 kilos of supplies and the basics for a new life in the West. Drinking water is captured from rain on the wagon canvas. Even the oxen's dung is fuel for fires. but they also need cash. Native Americans charge $10 for road tolls and $100 for river crossings in modern money. Twenty thousand Americans will die reaching the west. Ten graves for every one and a half kilometers. But one pioneer story will reveal the most extreme hardships of the journey west.
June 1846. A wagon train heads west. Its leader is George Dunner. Good luck. We'll catch you in a great time. Let's go, Jack. Thank His wife, Tamsin Donner, is a school teacher. Yes. Okay. 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 But on the trail, women must turn their hands to anything. The Donner party are halfway across the blistering Wyoming prairie, far away from the nearest doctor with barely any water. The women who came across America in the early days must have been made up of uh, the strongest fiber possible. It's unimaginable. Good. The child's mother and father are Philippine and Ludwig Kesselberg. They christened their son, Louis. The journey is tough, but the going's good. Times in Donna writes in a journal. I could never have believed we could have traveled so far with so little difficulty. Indeed, if we do not experience anything worse, I shall say the trouble is all in getting started. But as leader of the wagon train, Tamsin's husband, George Donner, is aware there's one final obstacle to their journey. The mountains of the Sierra Nevada. With peaks reaching 4,000 meters, in winter, they're impassable. As the Donner party approaches Utah, George Donner makes a fateful decision, leading a splintered group off from the main party. He's read one of the many new trail guidebooks, showing a shortcut that claims to shave two weeks off the journey time. Hastings' cutoff is said to be a saving of 400 miles. We are informed it is a fine level road with plenty of water and grass. But Donna's information is wrong. In fact, the shortcut adds 160 kilometers to the journey. High in the Sierra Nevadas, the Donner Party enters the Truckee Pass. They're only 50 kilometers from the safety of the California Plains. But supplies are dangerously low, and traveling through the mountains is taking its toll. A broken axle forces the Donner Party to stop to make repairs. But that night, one and a half meters of snow falls. Soon the drifts are nearly 20 meters deep. The Donner Party 
will be stranded for five months. In just three weeks, they've eaten all their food. Then they kill their pack animals. Next, they eat charred bones, twigs, bark, leaves, dirt, and worse. Even the wind held its breath as the suggestion was made that were one to die, the rest might live. Cannibalism. Christmas, 1846, they eat their first human. Bodies are cut up, flesh labeled so people don't eat their own relatives. Four rescue parties bring out some survivors. The very last finds Philippines husband Ludwig alone. He is surrounded by bones, entrails, and a two-gallon kettle of human blood. George Donner's body is found, skull split open, his brain removed. Tamsin Donner's body is never found. pass is renamed the Donner Pass, a testament to the hardship of the pioneers push west. Today, it's the Lincoln Highway. But beneath the bones of the Donner Party, the Sierra Nevadas conceals a seam of gold the largest the world has yet seen. Gold fever is about to change the West and the people heading there. March 1836, the Battle of the Alamo in Texas. The United States' runaway expansion has brought it into conflict with the Mexican Empire. Mexico's vast territories stretch from Oregon to Guatemala. But Texas is disputed territory. The Mexican government has invited American settlers in, but they quickly flood the territory in overwhelming numbers. Americans by the thousands were coming into Texas and they were not abiding to the agreements to come in as settlers. And once they outnumber by 1835 Mexicans 10 to 1 in that area, of course the Americans are thinking about independence. At the Alamo, the pioneers make their stand for independence. In an old Spanish mission, 200 American settlers are under attack. Attempting to retain control of Texas, a Mexican army storms the makeshift fort. The siege ends in a massacre, 186 defenders dead. At the Alamo, brave men like Davy Crockett become heroes and martyrs. Women and children are spared and sent back home to spread the message, don't come. <laughs> it 
It's a turning point. By the end of 1848, war with Mexico has brought both Texas and California into the Union. That same year, a new rush westward begins. It's triggered deep within the earth, where over millions of years, vast geological forces have created gold. The seam in the Sierra Nevadas is one of the densest on the planet. In 1848, Carpenter, James Marshall, finds a three-ounce nugget in the California River. Two months' pay in his hand, but billions of dollars beneath his feet. News of Marshall's discovery spreads to every corner of the world. Everyone wants to get rich quick. Within a year, a hundred thousand desperate amateur prospectors flood the Sierra foothills. It was the American dream distilled to its essence. Take yourself and go out and try and make a success of it. A Chinese prospector's hundred ounce strike in the Yuba River. $26,000 made by a single Irishman in just four days. A $200,000 super seam mined by 12 Mexicans at Bear Valley. In the port of San Francisco, a plot of land worth $16 before the gold strike now changes hands for $45,000. In two years, the population of California explodes from 15,000 to 100,000. Now hand panning is replaced by lines of sluice boxes as men comb for anything the first prospectors missed. The price of living rockets. Picks, pans and shovels go from a few cents to ten dollars a piece. Breakfast costs ten times what it does back east, but still the people come. Two hundred ships lie abandoned in San Francisco Harbor, their crews having deserted and rushed for the hills. After a journey of nearly ten thousand kilometers, and now without money and on foot, Belgian Jean-Nicolas Pelot writes, We crossed 200 miles of wilderness full of Indians, bears, panthers, wildcats, snakes of every kind. The first thing he finds isn't gold, it's graves. 200 of them. Prospectors cut off by rains in the foothills who've starved to death. Approaching, we realized animals of some kind had dug up the bodies. I read a note attached to one of the graves. God has willed that civilization should begin in this place. With this duty, which a man owes to his kind, bury the dead. Perlow does find gold, but never in the quantities that he dreamed of. As the gold fields are picked clean, tensions rise, times get tough. <laughs> After just six years, the gold rush is over. I think
think that there is that Western uh, mentality of prospecting, uh, try and fail, try and fail, and the fact that you tried is worthy in and of itself. Of the 300,000 who rushed to find gold, less than one out of a hundred strike it rich. But fortunes are made by the merchants and landowners who supply the miners. From dirt and dreams come the great cities of California. But the new nation's hunger for goods triggers another kind of revolution. October 1818, a nine-year-old boy comforts his mother as she lies on her deathbed. Milk sickness kills thousands of pioneers every year. The cause? White snake root, eaten by cattle. A deadly poison passed in milk to humans. At 18, the boy becomes a man. But he has been working for years, battling for existence in this harsh environment. It was a wild region, with many bears and other wild animals still in the woods. There I grew up. I had an axe in my hand from my eighth to my 20th year. This is the life of an American settler. The young man's grandfather followed Daniel Boone's wilderness road into Kentucky. His father pushed further into the forest of Indiana. Settler families live in basic single-room log cabins, sometimes housing ten or more. The wilderness provides everything. They make their own plows, rakes, forks, shovels, build their own furniture, and they bury their dead. In bad years, malaria kills one in eight of the settlers. Life expectancy is half of what it is today. From these hard-working settlers come America's 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. If you work hard, you can do anything you want to do. The possibilities are endless. To me, that was the American dream as a kid. Lincoln's family and thousands like them settled the West in four generations. President Thomas Jefferson thought it would take a thousand. The forests are cleared at a rate of five acres per family per year. In 1800, 23 million acres of Indiana is wilderness. In 60 years, it's tamed, flat, fertile farmland. But clearance means more than forests. It's always been one of the deep flaws of the American imagination that it can't imagine a future for American Indian people. As Americans, American Indian people have to imagine that for themselves. And that's, that's the hard part. Keep walking. 1830, President Andrew Jackson declares a new policy, a policy that America will maintain for more than 100 years. The forced relocation of American tribal people onto reservations. The bill passes Congress by a single vote. Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, Seminole, Cherokee, all forced off their lands at the point of a bayonet. An episode in the conquest of the West that even some of the soldiers taking part find shameful. U.S. Army Private John G. Burnett writes, 
The sufferings of the Cherokee were awful. The trail of the exiles was a trail of death. They slept in the wagons and on the ground without fire. I saw as many as 20 die in a single night of pneumonia, cold, exposure. Move along. Move along. Their march of 1,600 kilometers becomes known as the Trail of Tears. It's a shameful act in American history, and it's in its own way sort of an iconic act because it really symbolizes what happened to the Native Americans. Elsewhere, the West is being transformed in other ways. Running from Minnesota to New Orleans is the mighty Mississippi River, 3,000 kilometers long, is fed by rainfall from 31 states. It's a lifeline connecting the West to the outside world. If roads exist, they're muddy tracks. This is the only trade route that allows settlers to sell the produce they've sweated over. A huge amount of goods are shipped out, but they're shipped out in the in, in this most nickel and dime way. A farmer will build a flatboat, fill it up with hogs, uh, sassafras root, ginseng root, uh, tobacco, whatever it is you grow, put it on the flatboat, use the power of the Mississippi to drift you down to sell them along the riverbank. At the age of 19, Abraham Lincoln makes his first trip down the Mississippi on a simple raft. The current is too strong to return upstream. The primitive flatboats are simply sold as lumber in New Orleans. Farmers then have to walk up to a thousand kilometers home. But on his first journey, Lincoln sees the future. A new invention which will transform the Mississippi, the Midwest and America. Steamboat was the 19th century's time machine, just as surely as the airplane was the 20th century's time machine. It shrunk distance. By shrinking distance, it enabled commerce. Even upstream, steamboats can travel 80 kilometers a day, eight times faster with eight times the cargo of a raft. The early models are dangerous. More than half explode but their number triples every decade. They make the Midwest America's economic heartland. In just four generations, America has grown from a 500 kilometer strip of colonies on the eastern seaboard to a continental powerhouse.